Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first online webinar training. The class is chlorine safety, core alkali electrolysis. How is chlorine made? You basically add salt and water and then add electricity to it, and you get three byproducts. One is chlorine, one is sodium hydroxide or caustic soda, and the other is hydrogen. This is basically a simp very simple process. Chlorine chemical properties. It's a liqui liquefied compressed gas. It's non-flammable. Uh, it's clear amber color as a liquid. Yellowish green color as a gas. It is one and a half times heavier than water and two and a half times heavier than air. So that means that if you ever have a release, that it will seek the lowest point in the room and settle in that area. It boils at minus 29.6 20, degrees Fahrenheit, so it's very cold. Chlorine freezes at minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. One volume of liquid can expand to 460 times its volume as a gas, meaning one drop of chlorine liquid will expand 460 times its size on, on the ground as a gas. So you can imagine one drop expanding 460 times how big that gets. Odor detection can take place as low as 0.2 to 0.3 ppm parts per million. That means that it, it doesn't take very much of it for you to smell it in, in your process. The OSHA permissible limit is one part per million, uh, which is relatively low. Gas is visible at approximately 25 parts per million. That means you can see the green, yellowish green uh, gas hovering in the air. Reactivity. Dry chlorine is compatible with most metals except titanium, tin, and aluminum. However, wet chlorine is very reactive and corrosive to most metals. Wet chlorine forms hydrochloric acid, which will attack all steel products and anything that's that steel will corrode and rust to give you a a example of what can happen we had a uh, customer in kentucky that mixed sodium hypochlorite and uh del pack 2020 and it off gassed chlorine that that was the reaction of the two chem mixing the two chemicals, and it completely ruined their telemetry room uh, where they had all their their controls, and so they had to replace everything. Uh, it was a it was a very bad mess. So anytime chlorine comes into contact with steel, it, it, it's it's not a good thing. Chlorine reacts violently with steel at temperatures above 450 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have a fire in your chlorine storage room, uh, the reaction is, is, is very violent. It, 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 it's not, it won't explode, but it, it will definitely make the fire hotter. Chlorine can support combustion above 480 degrees Fahrenheit as well. So. Moving on, wet and dry chlorine refers to the amount of moisture or water in the chlorine gas. Wet chlorine is not bleach, not sodium hypochlorite. Most chlorine packers use minus 40 degrees dew point air to move the chlorine from the rail car to their cylinders or tons, ton cylinders. Chlorine reacts violently with substances such as grease, oil, paint, some solvent. Uh, always check compatibility with any new products before you introduce them. Vapor pressure is, is temperature specific. 
So if you have a, a cylinder, uh, 150 pound or ton cylinder, minus four degrees Fahrenheit when it's very cold, the pressure is very low in that cylinder, 13.4 pounds per square inch. As the temperature gets hotter, obviously the pressure builds. So 68 degrees Fahrenheit is what we call ambient, uh, which is, you know, normal temperature. The standard uh, pressure pounds per square inch at that temperature is 81.9. Um, obviously, if it's a very hot day, 100, 104 degrees Fahrenheit, your pressure is going to be very high in your cylinder. 149 pounds per square inch. So this is a, a useful information in in, in your uh, plants for for when temperatures are are very high. Uh, chlorine derived products. A lot of uh, products that we use in our daily lives are derived from chlorine use. They're used in paper manufacturing. PVC, CPVC, pharmaceuticals, agriculture, a lot of industries. And we'll see that also in water and wastewater treatment. Chlorine uses. Um, a breakdown of, of what uh, chlorine is used for. You can see that disinfection of water is a very low use, 4% of the total chlorine manufactured in, in the United States. The, the biggest user of, of chlorine is uh, in the PVC manufacturing process, plastics. You also have uh, organics and inorganics that it's used to manufacture. So this, is, this gives you a kind of a breakdown of, of everything that chlorine is used for and and the water and wastewater treatment is, is a small slice of the pie in the, in that area shipping containers we'll get into the meat and potatoes of of the the uh training here today movement methods dot shipping information when you see us pull up onto your property with uh chlorine Cylinders, you'll see this placard 1017 class 2. Uh, the, the shipping name is Chlorine. UN number is obviously 1017. Hazard class is 2.3, uh, which will be noted on the labels and the placard. In the emergency response guidebook, uh, which all drivers have, uh, this Chlorine is on page 124. Reportable quantity is 10 pounds or more. So if, if you've got a 150 pound uh, chlorine cylinder hooked up and something happens and you have a leak and it goes, you know, from 250 pounds full to 238 pounds, uh, you've lost 12 pounds. Uh, and at that point, it's a uh, EPA reportable quantity that we have to make a report on. That that's for any any release of chlorine. All right, um, container types. As you'll see here, there's chlorine and sulfur dioxide. Uh, chlorine is on the right. It's it's a gray color. Uh, you have a 150 pound cylinder, and you also have a one ton cylinder. Our supplier is Jones Chemical Incorporated. Uh, these particular ones uh, are out of Charlotte, North Carolina, but um, we get ours from their uh, Barberton, Ohio uh, location. So these are what they look like. Ton container, uh, DOT spec number, DOT 106A500. They're about a six foot 10, inches or 82 inches in uh, length. They're about 30 inches in diameter. Uh, weighs between 1,100 and 1,600 pounds empty. It has two concaved ends. They have two valves and six fuse plugs. 
for each one on a ton container. The hydrostatic test pressure that they test them at is 500 pounds per square inch. And it's used, they're used for multiple gases, but in this, in, for this uh, case, we're talking about chlorine. A 150 pound cylinder, the smaller of the two. Uh, the, the DOT specification is DOT 3A 480 or 3AA 480. Uh, container height's about four, 54 and a half inches tall. Diameter is about 10 and a quarter inches around. It weighs between 80 and 126 pounds empty. Has one valve with one built in fuse plug. The hydrostatic test pressure is 800 pounds per square inch. The, the, uh, one of the most frequent questions I get is, uh, the hydrostatic test pressure is why is it so much higher for a, uh, for a 150 pound cylinder than it is for a ton cylinder? That, that, pressure is set by the DOT as, as far as the testing goes. That's the only real answer that I have come up with so far. But 150 pound cylinder is also used for multiple gases as well. You'll see it for oxygen, for uh, welding, acetylene, several different types of gases. Okay, container valves. There are two differences between a ton, ton and cylinder valve. The fuse plug in a cylinder and the orifice size. These are what the valves look like, as well as the fuse plug. Maximum, maximum continuous discharge rates, uh, pounds per hour at, at 70 degrees, which is roughly ambient temperature with a 35 pounds per square inch back pressure. For a 150 pound cylinder, uh, the gas is one and three quarter pounds. As a liquid is 200 pounds. A ton container is 15 pounds as a gas and 400 pounds as a liquid. Okay, fuse plugs. Fuse plugs melt at 158 degrees to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, give you an interesting story. We had something that we should never, ever, ever do. We had a customer that was trying to open the valve of a 150-pound cylinder of chlorine in their, in their chlorine room. And they were struggling with getting it open, and the operator decided to put, take a torch and put heat to it to see if that would help it. What he effectively did was he melted the fuse plug and created a uh, release of chlorine in their, in their, in their chlorine room. Um, don't. Don't ever, ever put heat to a valve on chlorine or any anything, for that matter. But they lost a 150-pound cylinder of chlorine, destroyed their, their chlorine room. So that, that's what can happen. That's what we've seen. So it's a good example of what not to do. So please don't add uh, heat to, to anything trying to get it open. If you can't get it open, call us. We'll pick it back up the next time and bring you another one. Okay. These are our delivery trucks. These are how we transport 150-pound cylinders in, in racks that are chained and secured. Sometimes you'll see us uh, pull in and they'll be strapped to the side of the, the truck as well if we're not bringing a full rack of, of cylinders. These are how they're transported, strapped onto a, a cylinder flat, secured. This is how we transport one cylinder 
on a cylinder dolly. A lot of times you'll see them uh, roll the cylinders with their hands uh, when they're unloading them at your facilities. You know, those that's a safe method as well, but this is how we recommend that they handle them. Accident prevention. Containers are heavy, obviously. Uh, a full ton cylinder weighs roughly 3,500 pounds, and a full 150-pound uh, cylinder weighs roughly 250 pounds. Uh, get some help. Uh, use power equipment if you have it. Use hoists, obviously, for, for ton cylinders. Uh, and use your, your hand trucks. Leak prevention kit. Okay, a lot of times in the storage of, of chlorine, we have uh, leak detection sensors. And it's, it's sometimes very difficult uh, to find which container is leaking. The kit includes aqua ammonia vapor uh, bottle, uh, chlorine wrench, and new lead washers, and an escape respirator. Now, obviously, you only want to use the vapors of the ammonia. You don't want to squirt ammonia on cylinders. So cut your straw to where it doesn't go directly into the ammonia in the bottle and just squeeze the vapors. If there's a leak on a cylinder, it'll, it will come up as white smoke. Uh, then that way you'll know which cylinder is leaking. Uh, the, the purpose of the, the wrench and the lead washers is uh, sometimes you can add a washer or swap it out and stop the leak if it if it's a very small leak by adding the the washer to it to the valve uh the pocket respirator uh is an escape respirator only uh if you have say you're working on a a leaking cylinder that has a small leak it's it's not made for you to to stay in the same vicinity very long it's made for you to to escape the, the leak itself. Okay, when, when you have your cylinders hooked up, you obviously want to check the pressure and the, and the weight of the, those cylinders to make sure you don't have any leaks uh, versus your feed rate. Um, always avoid excessive heat. Obviously, the story I told about the, the guy with the torch, you see uh, this gentleman here is welding. So please keep it away from, from high temperatures. This is what can happen with uh, a fire uh, on the left-hand side. You'll see two 150-pound uh, cylinders that were involved in a fire uh, that, that, that melted. Uh, and, and basically, they had a 300-pound release of chlorine. And then... On the right hand side is a ton cylinder that was involved in a fire and the pressure got so high that it blew the blew a big hole in in the concave end of uh the ton cylinder so just avoid fire as much as possible okay never use these to close or open a valve don't use pliers don't use vice grips, don't use pipe wrenches, hammers, cheater bars, or anything. We have chlorine wrenches that we use specifically designed for uh, opening and closing the valves on cylinders. When you are done with a, a, a chlorine, or, or even in this case, a sulfur cylinder, you want to make sure that you close the valve properly. Close it tight so it does not leak. This this one in particular uh, was 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 not even closed. There is still residual uh, gas in these uh, cylinders once they're deemed empty. 
and this is what happens. It corrodes the valve, it corrodes down, it runs down the side of the cylinder, uh, really makes a, a mess. And, you know, we, we need to return those things back to our supplier in, in good condition as well. So just a, a tip to, to make sure that the, the valve is closed on the cylinder once you're done using it. Uh, don't pressurize the containers. Don't add pressure to them. Uh, this is what can happen uh, in this in this document here uh, or picture. Uh, the the concave then is is uh, pushed out, and uh, it's not a good situation. You can see where uh, chlorine has leaked out of it, so we we don't like to see that either. Maintain your chlorine system. Make sure that it's functioning properly. No leaks, uh, no, no uh, conditions that I've shown so far with, with chlorine running down the sides of your cylinders, uh, etc. Okay, uh, let's take a break for a second here. Is, are there any questions, Dominica, so far? No, sir. Not right now. Okay. So, what I want to get into now is emergency response. And when I came into this industry, I had, you know, no experience with chemicals whatsoever, especially with gas chemicals like chlorine and sulfur dioxide. And, you know, when, when you hear the words, we've got a chlorine leak, um, the first thing you do, you know, the normal response from anyone is panic, okay? That was my first response uh, when I first heard those words from a customer is we have a chlorine leak. Typically, you forget everything you've been trained to, to, to do, and it takes you a minute to get your bearings about you, to, to get that memory back. Um, don't panic. Uh, that is my biggest uh, words of advice to anyone in this situation, is don't panic. Remember what you've been trained to do, okay? We're going to go over some of that here shortly uh and also don't hold your breath uh that is not going to work uh, obviously if you have a large leak holding your breath is not going to work you need to get away as fast as you can and inform as many people as you can if chlorine is released don't panic warn others make sure that you warn everyone, we have a chlorine leak, get away. And most places, I'll give you a, a funny story. Like I said, when I first started in this industry, I had no experience with uh, chemicals or anything like that. Um, my boss, about the first week I was there, he come in my office and said, we need to order a windsock. I said, yes, sir. You know. Pride got the best of me. I didn't want to admit to him, but I didn't know what a wind sock was. So after doing some Google research, I ordered a wind sock. And it came in, and unfortunately, it was about 40 to 50 foot long, um, and it was designed for airports and not chemical facility so <laughs> i uh i had to uh send it back and get get a proper one uh so that you know a lot of people don't know what wind socks are when, when you're dealing with chlorine it's one of the most useful tools that we have obviously you want to look at your wind sock uh if you have a chlorine leak you want to look at it to see which direction the wind is blowing and run the opposite direction okay that that's a good indicator 
of, of where you need to go to get away from the chlorine. Obviously, you want to get go the opposite way the wind's blowing. Hence, check your windsock. This is our windsock at our Lexington, Kentucky facility. <laughs> uh, you can see uh, it's blowing to the right here. You obviously want to go to the left. Follow your emergency plans, your emergency action plans. These are typically binders that we've all been trained to. There's various different types of information. Uh, with the CI Thornburg Company, we have uh, we're regulated by the Department of Homeland Security, so we also have uh, those policies and procedures in place, and our uh, staff is well trained in those areas. Also, the uh, EPA RMP risk management plan. We also have that binder, uh, as well as uh, SARA Title III uh, LEPC local emergency planning committees uh, binder. The uh, so there's a lot of programs that cover the same topics here uh, that we all need to be highly trained on. If you're trained and equipped. You can respond. As you see these two gentlemen here, they are working on a leak uh, on a 150-pound cylinder. Uh, they're in their moon suits. They have uh, SCBAs, which uh, are self-contained breathing apparatuses um, that protect them. We at CI Thornburg Company are not responders. The uh, the first thing you should do if you have a uh, chlorine or if you also use sulfur in the wastewater treatment industry, if you have a leak, you need to call 911 first. That should be your first call, okay? And then you can call CI Thornburg Company and we will support as best we can. Um, and, and, you know, that's part of this training. Um, how how to respond to a chlorine uh, emergency. So if you are some some places are trained and equipped to to uh, deal with uh, hazmat emergency responses, some places aren't. When you call nine one one later in the training here, uh, I'll show you what happens. Emergency kits and salvage cylinders. Obviously, CI Thornburg Company has A kits and B kits and salvage cylinders. Um, if you have, if you don't have one, and you have a small leak, uh, we'll loan you ours. We'll bring it to you uh, immediately. If you have a 150 pound cylinder that's leaking, we have salvage cylinders or what's commonly referred to as coffins. We will not place the cylinder in the coffin. We'll bring the coffin to you, but we will not place it in the, the coffin itself. That typically is done by a fire department. So if, during any emergency response situation, we'll bring the material. We just can't respond to it. We're not going to put our employees that aren't trained in, in emergency response. So we'll give you all the, the tools that you need. We'll support the fire department as well, and that's 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 our role in all of this. Um, but as you can see, you have the the B kit and you have the A kit for 150 pound cylinders. Uh, most places are equipped uh, with both of those. Uh, new equipment. You can see the new B kit here. Uh, it's, it's very easy to install. Uh, with a chime clamp, um, very, very simple, very quick. We are, you know, everyone should be trained on how to use the, the B kit uh, if you're using ton cylinders. What responders want to know? So once you've called 911, typically they will send the fire department or the nearest fire department that is trained in hazmat. Um, when they show up, they're going to want to know, is everyone accounted for, number one? 
what was the the material is it a gas or a liquid obviously uh was it full or empty what was the situation were you hooking it up were you unhooking it or was it just in storage how many containers are hooked up some places you go to some water treatment plants you know they'll have have six ton cylinders of chlorine hooked up and ready to go uh some at some of the larger places which container is leaking how can i identify it um this is where having a a picture of your chlorine room you know if there's a if there's a leak uh having a picture available to to show the uh first responders the hazmat team how you know what what the condition is inside that room in a normal circumstance is is very useful i recommend that you have that for them next question is where is it leaking can the container be rotated okay in this in, in this instance Ton cylinders have both liquid and gas chlorine in them. Okay. So obviously the gas chlorine is in the up position and you're, you're leaking there. You want to turn that cylinder over. Okay. To where the gas, the, the liquid is, is, is pl essentially plugging up the leak. Okay. So that, that's what that means. Can it be rotated? Um, is there a gauge or scale? Most places use gauges and scales to, to measure their chlorine and, and sulfur dioxide. What can I trip on or what can I tear my hazmat suit on? Is there anything in the way? What, you know, that's where the picture comes in. Uh, to place they can identify those those types of trip hazards and things by that picture uh, do you have a scrubber or automatic shutdown do you have an emergency capping kit which is the a kit or the b kit uh, do you have digital pictures of your system are your are your key valves marked to where i know i turn off this this feed valve it's going to shut it off uh, what other products are being used if, if there's more than one product in that room? Uh, and the last one is, have we met before? I highly recommend that you develop relationships with your first responders. You know, when, when they show up, it's nice to know that, that, you know, know that person. You know, in the video that we're going to watch, the lead operator uh mentions this having that relationship is a good thing so when they show up they know who to talk to so i highly recommend having them out <coughs> to your facilities okay first aid inhalation obviously you want to move the victim to fresh air without delay Remove contaminated clothing and wash the skin with water. <clears throat> if person is not breathing, call 911, then give art artificial respiration if you're trained to do so. <clears throat> CPR. Obviously seek medical attention and refer to the SDS. There's a lot of good information on the SDSs, so, so please refer to those if you have someone that's been exposed. <clears throat> okay, skin or eye contact. You obviously, again, want to remove contaminated clothing and wash the skin with water. If the irritation persists after the irrigation, or if skin is broken or blistered, you obviously want to get medical attention. Eye contact. Obviously, uh, wash the eyes with large amounts of water for 15 to 20 minutes. Holding the holding your eyelids apart, making sure that the water is is getting to your eyes, <clears throat> and get medical attention immediately. Okay, chloride. This is this is your your 
uh, emergency response help. Core app is a help is a phone call away. <clears throat> Chlorine emergency plan. Uh, Core app response teams are trained to offer professional response and technical assistance to all chlorine incidents. Uh, the teams are made up of chlorine producers. You know, J Jones Chemical is, is one. And they're verified response contractors. They're trained in responding to specifically chlorine incidents. They're available 24 7, 365. <clears throat> Their coverage is nationwide to include Canada. They have uh, 21 primary teams. 16 of those in the U.S. and five in, in Canada. And then they have 68 secondary teams, 60 in the U.S. and eight in Canada. They, they consist of level two and level three contractors. Primary teams handle all chlorine incidents. Secondary teams primarily handle tons and cylinders. Chloref is activated through Chemtrek. You'll see uh, Chemtrek's number on a lot of our documents, a lot of the, the uh, ship tickets that you receive uh, at your facilities from us. That number, Chemtrek, 800-424-9300, is a uh, great resource. If you have a, a leak or a release, you can contact them if you don't have a trained fire department in hazmat. You know, once you call 911, they may have to dispatch, depending on your location, you may be very far away from a fire department that's trained for hazmat. If that's the case, you can call Chemtrek and they will send someone immediately uh, to your facility to respond to this incident. They, they, they look at where you're located and they send the, the closest response team to your facility. Usually, you know, in the West Virginia area, uh, usually that would be uh, like Jones Chemical or even uh, some other uh, companies that, that handle chlorine, Univar, others like that, that manu actually manufacture chlorine and are trained to respond. So there's always help. Uh, it's just a phone call away. Uh, remember this number. Um, but yes, call Chemtrek uh, if you're not close to a trained fire department. Very useful resource. This is their sector map. Uh, as you can see, uh, West Virginia is, is sector seven. So there's kind of hard to see, uh, where the response teams are, but in the West Virginia area, they would probably come out of Ohio, uh, depending on where you're located. This is how they look when they show up. Uh, they're, they're, like I said, they're highly trained to specifically chlorine incidents. Uh, they, they're gonna show up with their moon suits and their SCBAs and they're gonna take care of the problem. Uh, like I said earlier, they consist of level two contractors as well as level three. Now, I wanna get to a, a story here. This picture, is from a town in South Carolina. This is one of the largest uh, chlorine disasters that we've we've had here in the United States. This happened a few years ago, uh, about two o'clock in the morning, in this sleepy little town. The uh, we had a train train derailment, obviously. But involved in this derailment was a 90-ton rail car. At 2 o'clock in the morning, it split in half and released 90 tons of chlorine 
into, into the environment. Police and first responders knew something had happened, so they rushed to this facility. They didn't know what they were going to experience. Once they got there, they rushed in and were overwhelmed with chlorine gas. A total of nine people lost their lives that this morning, you know, on that morning. So this is how serious uh, chlorine is. <clears throat> it's very dangerous. That's why training is so key to responding. Your emergency action plan training, your RMP training, you know, all of that is very important. And this training here is part of that, to make sure that everyone knows the risk and knows uh, the seriousness of, of chlorine handling. Uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, a lot of damage was done. Um, and you can see the 90-ton the rail car, uh, there was actually two of them involved, but only one of them leaked. That's the one on the the uh, left hand side. It was split in half. So be very be very careful, guys. Chlorine, you know, it it's very useful to disinfection and and your processes. But please understand the dangers and risks uh, that are involved with handling chlorine. It can be done safely and with very minimal risk. You know, this, I refer back to the story where the op plant operator applied a, a, a torch uh, to the valve of one. Uh, please don't do that. Um, if you cannot open the valve on on any cylinder, uh, please give us a call. We'll we'll swap it out with a new one. Uh, so we get those sometimes uh, for whatever reason. Uh, we'll send it back to the supp our supplier and get that taken care of for you. Um, the Chlorine Institute, uh, the C.I. Thornburg Company is a member of the Chlorine Institute. We follow their, their policies and procedures very closely in our operation. It was established in 1924. It's a nonprofit trade association. Got 200 member companies worldwide. Their focus is on improving safety, security, health, and environmental performance in the chloroalkali chemical industry. There's a lot of resources there uh, in this uh, website. The video that you're getting to going to be watching here in just a second comes from the Chlorine Institute. Uh, specifically for water and wastewater treatment operators. There's a lot of pamphlets that they have uh, that can provide information to your facilities on how to handle, how to move, how to feed chlorine. It covers everything. So I highly recommend visiting that website, www.cl2.com. This video provides guidelines for the safe handling and use of chlorine at water and wastewater treatment facilities. It represents a compilation of current practices and experience from Chlorine Institute members with substantial input from representatives of the National Rural Water Association and the Water Environment Federation. The Chlorine Institute initiated its stewardship program to better achieve its mission of supporting the chloralkali industry. The program serves the public by fostering continuous improvements to safety and protection of human health and environment connected to the production, distribution, and use of its mission chemicals. This support extends to giving continued attention to the security of chlorine handling operations. This video demonstrates the Institute's support of the principles of the program. While this video covers the safe handling of chlorine, it's intended to be supplemental to your employee training program. Our safety culture is definitely based on being proactive, getting the training, having knowledge, knowing what to do, as opposed to having an accident and then wondering, what do I do now? 
The value of a strong safety culture cannot be overstated. Experience shows that positive safety attitudes and operator awareness, understanding, and acceptance of safe work practices can help prevent serious incidents and injuries. That, in turn, can provide for better continuity of operations and lower operating costs. From a worker's perspective, there are many potential distractions that can impact workplace safety. Complacency is an enemy to a positive safety culture. The notion that future accidents are unlikely if accidents haven't occurred in the past, even if procedures were not followed correctly, can lead to a false sense of security and compromised situational awareness. It is critically important that operators keep their minds on the job and stay focused on their duties, especially when working with hazardous materials like chlorine. Further information may be obtained from Chlorine Institute Pamphlet 155, Water and Wastewater Operators Chlorine Handbook, and from the safety data sheet for chlorine issued by your supplier. A copy of the Chlorine Institute publication can be found on our website. The transportation, storage, and use of chlorine are regulated by a variety of governmental agencies. Compliance is essential, so it's important that people working with chlorine have a sound knowledge of the applicable regulations. In the United States, we have public water with chlorine disinfection, which started at the turn of the century, has saved hundreds and thousands of people from disease. There's, you know, there's no doubt about it. It's very easily proven. I think that we forget because we are so used to it, but we are definitely the guardians of, you know, the chemical delivery and the chemical safety of chlorine to our consumers. The simple things make life more enjoyable, but they're not always as simple as you might think. Behind the scenes, a lot of effort goes into improving the quality of our lives. One important aspect of this is the use of chlorine to disinfect drinking water and wastewater. And in the products we use every day, chlorine is used to manufacture thousands of other chemicals. And it's used to purify many metals, including the process that recycles aluminum cans. It's used in the production of most medicines. And its largest use is in the manufacture of plastics. Chlorine's usefulness can be attributed to its unique physical and chemical properties. But like many other chemicals, chlorine can also be hazardous and must be handled and used with care. So it's important for you to know all you can about this versatile chemical and to understand the proper handling of chlorine to avoid exposure. In this program, we'll cover the physical and chemical properties of chlorine, health effects, personal protective equipment, transportation, storage, and safe handling, how to connect, use, and disconnect chlorine containers, how to respond to minor leaks, emergency preparedness and training, and site security. Chlorine is identified by the chemical symbol CL. While it is not explosive or flammable, as a liquid or gas, it can react violently with many substances. As a gas, chlorine has a pale yellow to greenish yellow color, depending on concentration. It is visible at concentrations above 25 to 60 parts per million, depending on humidity. It has an extremely disagreeable and pungent odor, similar to chlorine-based laundry bleach and it's detectable by smell at concentrations as low as 0.2 to 0.4 parts per million. It is about two and a half times heavier than air, so if it is released, it will accumulate at floor level and below ground level. As a liquid, chlorine is amber in color, and it is about one and a half times heavier than water. Chlorine is seldom seen in a liquid state, because it converts to gas at minus 29 degrees Fahrenheit at normal atmospheric pressure. When chlorine is shipped, it has very low moisture content and is referred to as dry chlorine. Dry chlorine has all of its water content dissolved in solution. If the water content exceeds its solubility, the chlorine would be defined as wet chlorine. The point where this occurs is temperature dependent. For example, at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 
chlorine with 30 parts per million moisture content would be dry chlorine, while at minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit, it would be wet chlorine. In the dry state, chlorine is not corrosive to copper or carbon steel. In its wet state, chlorine is highly corrosive to many metals. Wet chlorine can exist at your plant near the injector or in improperly dried sections of piping. When chlorine gas is added to water, it will react to form both hypochlorous and hydrochloric acids. When released from its container, one volume of liquid chlorine yields about 460 volumes of chlorine gas at room temperature and ambient pressure. This means that one 150-pound cylinder of chlorine could completely fill a 10 by 10 by 8 foot room with 100% chlorine gas, displacing all the air in the room. That same cylinder could fill a space the size of an enclosed football stadium with enough chlorine gas to exceed the OSHA ceiling limit of one part per million. Chlorine vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by the gas in its container. The vapor pressure increases dramatically as the temperature of the chlorine increases. The rapid vaporization of liquid chlorine causes the reduction in ambient room temperature. This can produce enough moisture condensation to fog protective face masks, freeze footgear to the ground, or cause frostbite. At very low temperatures, a pressure gauge might indicate that a chlorine vessel is empty, when in fact, the chlorine vapor pressure is low due to supercooled liquid chlorine remaining in the chlorine container. This situation can occur if chlorine gas is withdrawn too quickly from cylinders and ton containers. The remaining liquid chlorine can be cooled by the evaporating gas and result in reduced vapor pressure. Flow rates for chlorine cylinders and ton containers can vary significantly depending on operating equipment and conditions. The only way to make certain a container is empty of liquid chlorine is to weigh it on a scale. However, chlorine vapors will remain in the container. To ensure accuracy of the scale, follow the manufacturer's recommendations regarding scale calibration. More information on chlorine's physical and chemical properties can be found in Section 9 of the Safety Data Sheet. Now let's consider the adverse health effects that can result from exposure to chlorine gas or chlorine liquid. These include irritation to the eyes, respiratory system, and mucous membranes, as well as the skin. At the OSHA ceiling limit of one part per million, a person may experience mild mucous membrane irritation, which can be tolerated for up to one hour. As the concentration in air increases to 5 to 15 parts per million, a person may experience moderate irritation of the respiratory tract. The gas is very irritating at this point, and it's unlikely that any person would remain in such an exposure for more than a very brief time unless they are trapped or unconscious. The immediately dangerous to life or health concentration, or IDLH, for chlorine is 10 parts per million based on the potential for eye irritation, which can be severe enough to impair a person's ability to escape from a dangerous atmosphere. As the duration of exposure or concentration increases, apprehension and restlessness, along with coughing, throat irritation, and excessive salivation can occur. At higher levels of exposure, approaching 30 parts per million, a person may experience immediate chest pain, vomiting, and labored breathing. These symptoms can be experienced before chlorine gas is even visible. In extreme cases, where airborne concentrations may exceed 1,000 parts per million, a person can experience severe breathing difficulty, resulting in death within minutes. Symptoms may be more severe if a person has a pre-existing respiratory and or heart condition. People with respiratory problems are more vulnerable to problems resulting from chlorine inhalation. Special precautions, like the carrying of emergency respirators, should be considered. All employees who work around chlorine and have the potential of being exposed during normal operations should participate in a medical surveillance program designed to identify any adverse health effects which may occur as a result of chlorine exposure. The medical surveillance program also should verify a person's medical fitness for specific job tasks.
especially those tasks requiring the use of respiratory protection equipment and other protective clothing. For more information concerning the health effects of chlorine exposure, refer to Section 11 of the Safety Data Sheet. A variety of protective measures should be put into place when working around chlorine, including the use of personal protective equipment. Refer to the Extras folder on this DVD for more information about the proper selection, care, and use of personal protective equipment for tasks involving potential exposure to chlorine. Section 8 of the Safety Data Sheet is another good source of information on personal protective equipment. For workers who are not directly involved in handling chlorine in the general area of a facility or in buildings where chlorine is stored or used, no specialized protective clothing is required when routine plant operations are performed. Long pants, appropriate shirt, and eye protection, hard hat, and safety shoes should be worn or be available as directed by plant practice. All personnel entering areas where chlorine is stored or handled should carry an escape type respirator. Chemical cartridge or full face canister gas masks and air purifying respirators or APRs offer adequate protection provided the oxygen content in the air is greater than 19.5% and the chlorine concentrations do not exceed the rated capacity of the respirator. Also, verify that the cartridges or canister being used have not exceeded their recommended service life. Additionally, be aware that air purifying respirators are not acceptable for use in IDLH atmospheres. The level of respiratory protection required will vary depending on the task and the related hazard. Be sure to follow respiratory protection requirements that have been developed for the job you are performing. Fit testing and regular maintenance programs for all respirator equipment are necessary. Review OSHA's standard 29 CFR 1910.134 regarding the strict requirements for respirator use. A person should not attempt to perform a task requiring respirator use if they have not been fit tested or if they cannot get the face piece to seal properly. Specific personal protective equipment is required for certain activities, such as opening a line or other equipment that contains or previously contained chlorine. Pamphlets 155 and 65 contain the Institute's recommendations. Compatible gloves should always be worn as thermal protection from liquid chlorine. An emergency eye wash station and deluge shower should be provided near any potential exposure site. Eye wash stations and showers should be well marked and readily accessible. Should have a water supply that is tepid to promote a minimum of 15 minutes of flushing. Should be inspected periodically for proper operation and should include a mechanism to alert others when it is in use. Because chlorine is very reactive, transportation, storage, and handling must be conducted in a way which minimizes the risk of hazardous exposure. Refer to Section 7 and 14 of your supplier's safety data sheet for more information on chlorine transportation, storage, and safe handling. During transport, all chlorine is shipped as a liquefied gas under pressure. Chlorine may be shipped in cylinders, tongue containers, cargo tanks, and tank cars. This program focuses on cylinders and tongue containers. Additional training must be provided if your work involves cargo tanks, tank cars, or ISO tank containers. Cylinders with only one opening are used to transport chlorine. Most common sizes are 100 pound or 150 pound capacity. Cylinders are stamped near the neck ring area with the tear weight and the date of the last hydrostatic test. Cylinder valves are equipped with a pressure relief device consisting of a fusible metal plug in the valve body located below the valve seat. The fusible metal plug is designed to melt between 158 and 165 degrees Fahrenheit to relieve pressure in case of exposure to high temperatures. The valve is protected by a steel valve hood when not in use, and the cylinder should always be stored upright. Tongue containers are welded steel tanks with a chlorine capacity of 2,000 pounds and a loaded weight of as much as 3,650 pounds. The heads are either concave or convex. Tongue containers are stamped with a serial number 
the tear weight, and the date of the most recent hydrostatic test. The chimes provide a substantial grip for lifting beams. Fusible plugs in each head are also designed to melt at 158 to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. A removable protective housing protects the container valves. Since the transportation of chlorine requires special considerations, in most circumstances it is preferable to let your chlorine supplier transport the chlorine to each use site. Chlorine Institute pamphlet 76 should be reviewed. When unloading a chlorine shipment, you will need to follow special precautions. When transporting cylinders, the cylinders should be chained or clamped to a hand truck or other approved moving device. If the cylinders are secured in a storage rack, a forklift can be used. For short distances, cylinders may be moved by tilting and rolling them on their bottom edges. Cylinders should be lifted so that the valve protective housing is guarded and not used to carry any of the load weight. Once the cylinders have been moved to their storage area, the cylinders must be secured to prevent them from falling. Ton containers may be lifted using a hoist or forklift of sufficient capacity for the load. Hoists will be used in conjunction with a ton container lifting beam. Containers should be segregated from flammable and oxidizing materials and from reactive materials such as ammonia, sulfur dioxide, hydrocarbons, certain refrigerants, and other materials that are reactive with chlorine. Chlorine should also be segregated from other compressed or liquefied gases. However, if flammable materials are stored or processed in the same building, a firewall that meets the applicable fire and building code standards should be in place. Chlorine may be stored indoors or outdoors, as long as certain precautions are followed. Containers should not be stored in areas where they can drop, where heavy objects can fall on them, where vehicles can strike them, near elevators or heating, ventilating, or air conditioning systems because dangerous concentrations of gas may spread rapidly if a leak occurs, or below ground since chlorine vapors are heavier than air and will not readily dissipate from low areas in the event of a leak. Signs must be posted properly in the chlorine storage area in accordance with local codes as well as state and federal laws or regulations. Unauthorized personnel should not be allowed into the area. Local codes must be followed when storing chlorine indoors. Fire and building codes may dictate the legal requirements that apply, so review the codes in the community where your facility is located. Any buildings that will house chlorine containers or equipment should be designed and constructed to protect all elements of the chlorine system from fire hazards. Non-combustible construction is recommended. Gas detection equipment is recommended at all facilities to monitor for chlorine releases. It is essential that this equipment is inspected and calibrated on a regular schedule. Be sure to keep the area clean of trash and debris. Overhead shading should be provided in areas where direct sunlight may heat the container. Containers should be stored away from standing water. We never change a ton or, you know, turn a valve on a chlorine cylinder without having at least two people and having our PPE, you have your respirator, you know, your gloves, and you're ready in case there is an incidental leak because that is most likely when it is going to happen is when we are turning the valves and putting the switchovers off and on. When unloading or monitoring the unloading of rail tank cars and cargo tanks, U.S. Department of Transportation requirements must be followed. It's beyond the scope of this program to provide instruction on the unloading sequence for cargo tanks and rail cars. Your supplier and your company should provide that type of training. Chlorine Institute pamphlets number 49 and number 66 should also be reviewed. For cylinder or ton container mounted vacuum regulators and valve actuators, follow the manufacturer's procedures for connecting and disconnecting their equipment. Ton containers have two valves and can supply either gas or liquid. Ton containers should be set up so that the valves are aligned vertically. With the valves aligned vertically, the upper valve dispenses gas and the lower valve dispenses liquid. This ton container connection and disconnection sequence will utilize the upper or gas valve. 
The same procedure is used to connect and disconnect the lower or liquid valve. Feeding liquid chlorine requires different piping and fittings than shown in this video for chlorine gas. Refer to pamphlet 6, Piping Systems for Dry Chlorine, for more information. Note that the liquid valve faces the opposite direction from the gas valve. When connecting to the tongue container valve, begin by donning the appropriate personal protective equipment as dictated by your facility. Remove the valve bonnet. Check the packing nut to make certain it is at least hand tight. If it's not hand tight, contact your chlorine supplier for advice. Make certain the valve is closed before removing the outlet cap. Use an 8 inch wrench or a torque wrench set to 25 to 30 foot pounds to avoid over tightening. Remove the valve outlet cap. Make certain that the valve face is clean and smooth. Using an appropriate new gasket, connect the yoke and yoke adapter to the valve. Tighten the yoke to make the seal. Do not over tighten. Open and close the tongue container valve briefly, introducing chlorine into the system, and close it. Vapor from aqua ammonia solution should be used to test the yoke adapter interface and the packing land area for leaks. If using a squeeze bottle, cut the dispensing tube so that it does not extend into the liquid solution. If any leaks are found, they must be remedied before proceeding. Repeat the leak test procedure if a leak was found. Using a wrench no longer than 8 inches, open the valve one full turn. This is all that is required to achieve maximum gas flow rate. Open appropriate valves in the piping system. Check for leaks again using only the vapors from the aqua ammonia solution. A suitable valve shutoff wrench should be left in place when the container valve is open. The use of automatic shutoff devices should be considered. These devices close the container valve when activated by a chlorine detector, fire alarm, seismic detector, or remote switch. Follow the manufacturer's recommended procedures when emergency shutoff is needed. Special procedures must also be followed when disconnecting ton containers. Extreme caution must be exercised when disconnecting containers. This is especially critical in systems feeding liquid chlorine. After donning appropriate PPE as dictated by your facility, close the tongue container valve using an 8-inch wrench or a torque wrench set to 25 to 30 foot-pounds to avoid over-tightening. Let the pressure in the system drop to zero PSIG and apply a vacuum if your system is designed to do so. When gauges or other means indicate that all liquid and gaseous chlorine has been evacuated to zero PSIG or to some level of vacuum, the appropriate piping valve can be closed. If any leaks exist, evident by the pressure increasing in the line by the container, use a torque wrench to tighten the valve to 40 foot-pounds and retest for leaks. If the leak persists, use a maximum torque of 50 foot-pounds on the stem and repeat the process. If the valve still leaks, contact your supplier for advice. If the pressure in the line connected to the tongue container valve remains at or below zero PSIG, the yoke can be loosened and disconnected. Verify that a gasket is in place and replace the valve outlet cap. Attach the valve bonnet to the tongue container and mark as empty. Place the tongue container in the appropriate location for empty containers. The same steps will be performed when connecting to a cylinder. Chlorine is almost always fed as a gas when cylinders are used. Begin by donning the appropriate personal protective equipment as dictated by your facility. First, remove the protective hood. Check the packing nut to make certain it is at least hand tight. If it's not hand tight, contact your chlorine supplier for advice. Make certain the valve is closed before removing the outlet cap. Use an 8 inch wrench or a torque wrench set to 25 to 30 foot pounds to avoid over tightening. 
remove the valve outlet cap. Make certain that the valve face is clean and smooth. Using an appropriate new gasket, connect the yoke and yoke adapter to the valve. Tighten the yoke to make the seal. Do not over tighten. Open the container valve briefly, then close it. This introduces a small amount of chlorine into the system. Check for leaks around the yoke adapter interface and the packing gland using only the vapors from an aqua ammonia solution. If any leaks are found, they must be remedied before proceeding. Repeat this testing procedure if a leak is found. Using a wrench no longer than 8 inches, open the valve one complete turn. This is all that's required to achieve maximum flow rate. Check for leaks again. Open the appropriate valves in the piping system. Check for leaks again using only the vapors from the aqua ammonia solution. A suitable valve shutoff wrench should be left in place when the container valve is open. As with ton containers, special procedures must also be followed when disconnecting chlorine cylinders. Extreme caution must be exercised when disconnecting cylinders. After donning the appropriate TPE as dictated by your facility, close the cylinder valve using an 8-inch wrench or a torque wrench set to 25 to 30 foot-pounds to avoid over-tightening. Let the pressure in the system drop to 0 PSIG and apply a vacuum as appropriate for your system's design. When gauges or other means indicate that all liquid and gaseous chlorine has been evacuated to 0 PSIG or to some level of vacuum, the appropriate piping valve can be closed. Test for leaks using aqua ammonia vapor. If any leaks exist, evident by the pressure increasing in the line by the cylinder, Use a torque wrench to tighten the valve to 40 foot-pounds and retest for leaks. If the leak persists, use a maximum torque of 50 foot-pounds on the stem and repeat the process. If the valve still leaks, contact your supplier for advice. If the pressure in the line connected to the cylinder valve remains at or below 0 PSIG, the yoke can be loosened and disconnected. Verify that a gasket is in place and replace the valve outlet cap. Attach the protective valve hood on the cylinder as appropriate and mark as empty. Place the cylinder in the appropriate location for empty containers and make sure they are properly secured. Although rare, chlorine leaks may occur and you need to know how to identify and correct these problems as soon as possible. When a leak is detected, it's recommended that ammonia vapors be used to find the source. A white cloud will form when ammonia vapor is directed at the leak. A plastic squeeze bottle containing aqua ammonia solution should be used to detect minor leaks. If a wash bottle is used, be sure the dip tube is short enough so that only the vapor and not the liquid is directed toward the leak. If a cylinder or ton container is leaking liquid chlorine, whenever possible, you should position the container so the leak is above the liquid level. Be sure to wear the appropriate personal protection equipment as required by your facility before attempting any remedial action. When a leak occurs, Authorized, trained personnel equipped with respiratory and other PPE should investigate and take proper action. If a leak is detected around the valve stem, it can usually be stopped by tightening the packing gland after first closing the valve. 50 foot-pounds of torque on the packing nut should stop most leaks. Or if a leak occurs through the valve outlet, apply the valve outlet cap with an appropriate gasket. Then open and close the valve several times. Sometimes this will clean the stem seat and stop the leak. After closing the valve, remove the outlet cap and check for leaks. If the leak has not stopped, put the outlet cap back on. If these measures are not sufficient to stop a leak, then the appropriate Chlorine Institute emergency kit should be applied and the chlorine supplier notified. 
Chlorine Institute emergency kits and cylinder containment vessels are designed to contain most container leaks. Appropriate kits should be used, depending on the vessel. They include cylinder containment vessels, or kit A, for 100 and 150 pound cylinders, kit B, for ton containers, and kit C, for tank cars and tank trucks. Once an emergency kit is applied, contact the supplier or Chemtrek for further information. In cases where a leak has been identified within a system, the chlorine flow must immediately be turned off and pressure must be relieved. The system should then be evacuated of all chlorine before making any repairs. Replace any damaged section of pipe. If the piping is welded, welding must comply with all applicable codes. Before welding, use a dry non-reactive gas to purge the system. Dry nitrogen or dry air are suitable. Never weld near or on any chlorine container. More information can be found in Chlorine Institute Pamphlet 6, Piping Systems for Dry Chlorine. Actually, we have changed our safety protocols now. We work in Paris whenever we are opening a chlorine valve, changing the switch over. All of our chlorine detectors show up parts per million so that we know before we go in exactly how many parts per million are in that room and whether we can go in safely with a respirator as opposed to an FCBA device. In case of an accidental release of chlorine, your facility needs to be prepared to handle the emergency. The most effective response to a chlorine incident begins with careful and thorough planning. Anticipating all possible variables and situations that can occur during an incident is the basis for the site safety plan. A site safety plan is a comprehensive document that exists on any site that handles chlorine and provides a system for ensuring the safety of the responder, his or her team, and the public through communication of site-specific safety information. An effective site plan consists of the following elements. A summary of hazards that the team is likely to encounter. A review of the required safety equipment. A site map or sketch of the incident area. Specific work zones. Explanation of the use of the buddy system. Details of on-site communication. Command post information. An explanation of standard operating procedures. Information on medical assistance a monitoring plan, decontamination procedures, and other important and relevant information. The site safety plan is just that, a plan. Some aspects of the plan can be designated ahead of time, and other parts of the plan must be tailored to each incident, because each incident has its own unique challenges and constraints. We'll review each section briefly and point out which parts of the plan are often completed ahead of time, and which parts are determined at the onset of an incident. A comprehensive site safety plan will be tailored to the specific location and available resources. The summary of hazards section will contain information on the likely chemical hazards that are present that a team will encounter during the course of the response. It will also identify compliance requirements with the applicable safety and health regulations. An overview of hazards other than chemical such as confined space hazards, mechanical, electrical, biological, and physical hazards should be identified. At facilities that produce or use chlorine, this can be done in advance. On-site personnel control what enters the facility and should be well aware of the hazards within their facility. The plan will identify and explain the required safety equipment necessary and available for the response. This includes personal protective equipment, or PPE. The plan illustrates the different levels of protection and how the appropriate level is determined by the nature of the incident and the task performed. This is another aspect of the site safety plan where pre-planning can save valuable time. Based on published literature, such as the Chlorine Institute Pamphlet 65, Personal Protective Equipment for Chloralkali Chemicals, the determination for the initial level of PPE required can be made. Changing conditions may warrant a change in the PPE needed, but having an established PPE matrix can expedite the PPE selection process during an incident. 
The plan should include a site map or sketch of the incident area. It should be large enough to clearly show pertinent details and be posted in a conspicuous place. The components of the map should include details of the hazardous areas, site terrain, topography, buildings and barriers, land, water, and air access points, work crew locations, and off-site populations or environments at risk. As a whole, the site map is used for planning, training, and developing emergency response strategies. The exact location of an incident cannot be known prior to the start of an incident, so this part of the site safety plan cannot be prepared ahead of time. The site map should either be outlined on a pre-printed map or sketched by hand. Work zones are identified, specifying hot, warm, and cold areas, which are determined by the nature of the incident and environmental conditions. The plan should address the concept of the buddy system, that a minimum of two persons are required for each entry team, that a minimum of two persons are required for a backup rescue team, and all persons on all teams need to be equipped at the same level of protection. Details of on-site communication will be included in the plan. Emergency alerting processes, use and description of radio communication, phone, sirens, etc. Instructions on the use and meaning of hand signals, and a telephone list of the nearby community. The emergency alerting process should be in place long before an incident occurs and updated frequently. Command post information, such as the location and staffing requirements, will be identified in the plan. Standard operating procedures, as they pertain to the emergency response, will detail safe work practices and on-site response procedures, all designed for the safety of the team and the public. Medical assistance information will define a triage area and identify trauma center locations, distances, and availability. The site safety plan can include, ahead of time, where to find medical treatment techniques for the known hazards at that location, such as how to treat for chlorine inhalations. This can include reference to or access to pamphlet 63, first aid, medical management and surveillance, and occupational hygiene monitoring for chlorine. The site safety plan must be updated during an incident to note the location of a medical monitoring and treatment area. This location must be situated away from any hazards as a result of the incident. The monitoring plan will identify how the area will be monitored for air quality safety and measurement, the monitoring equipment necessary, and what is available, and is used in establishing work zones or action levels. A decontamination area should be identified and positioned upwind from the release. Procedures for handling the public and responders should be in place, as well as disposal of contaminated articles. Other important information that will be included in the site safety plan includes anything that is deemed necessary by the employer, staff meeting times, and a listing of equipment failures and any out-of-service equipment. Regular safety meetings should be conducted for each work shift, and personnel should sign off on the site safety plan after each meeting. The site safety plan is a critically important document, especially during the course of an emergency response. The responder must know how to access the plan and how to implement it. In addition, the responder must know the layout of the work zones, including hot, warm, and cold areas, entry and exit points, decontamination corridors, and areas reserved for medical treatment, location of the command post or where to report, the chain of command, individual responsibilities of the responder, training and knowledge requirements for his individual position and assigned tasks, and any other information that is deemed important by the employer or consumer. Finally, the responder should be in the mindset that the causes of the incident may not be accidental, but rather the result of a deliberate act. First responders should be aware that most shippers use cable seals to secure the tank car prior to shipment. If this seal is broken, this could indicate a deliberate malicious act. Caution and attention to all aspects of the safety plan will help ensure a successful containment.
Just remember, in an emergency, you are not alone. Chlorep is the Chlorine Institute's mutual aid program that provides a rapid and effective response to chlorine emergencies in the U.S. and Canada. Chlorep assistance during a chlorine emergency is available 24-7 through the Chlorine Institute's collaboration with Chemtrek and Kenyatech. To activate Chlorep for assistance with an incident, contact Chemtrek at 800-424-9300 or Kenyatech at 888-226-8832. Employee training is a key element in the facility's safety planning efforts. Your training will be specific to the container of chlorine you handle and will also address physical and health hazards, procedures for connecting, use, and disconnecting chlorine containers, and steps to take in the case of an accidental release or another emergency. Emergency responders will be required to have an adequate level of training to enable them to perform the job function they may be required to do in case of an emergency. For OSHA regulations, see 29 CFR 1910. In the event someone is accidentally exposed to chlorine, you will need to take special precautions. OSHA has specific requirements for entries into the affected area. Never attempt to rescue an unconscious victim unless you have been properly trained, are properly equipped, and a trained and equipped standby is on the scene. Don't become a victim yourself. It's also important for designated employees to have basic first aid training in the case of chlorine exposure. Prompt action is essential. Since anxiety and restlessness are symptoms of chlorine overexposure, it's important that firmness and assurance are used when assisting a victim. The first step to be taken when someone has been exposed to chlorine gas is to call 911 immediately and move the person to fresh air, position the person's head and trunk at a 45 to 60 degree angle, and encourage slow, regular breathing. If liquid chlorine has contaminated the skin or clothing, an emergency shower should be used immediately to flush off the chemicals, removing contaminated clothing while under the shower. If the eyes have been contaminated, they should be flushed with large amounts of water or a direct stream of water for at least 15 minutes while holding the eyes open. Medical assistance must be obtained as soon as possible. In cases where the individual has stopped breathing, qualified individuals will need to perform CPR. Safety data sheets and other literature will provide valuable information to help the response effort. These documents provide detailed information about the chemical's characteristics and also include emergency information. First aid information is provided in Section 4 of the safety data sheet. Chlorine suppliers may also be a valuable source of information and assistance in case of an emergency. The availability of such assistance should be determined during the planning effort. We had an open house, actually, and invited our local hazmat to come and see what our facilities are, and part of it was we had a section for comments for the first responders, and we got some really good feedback and comments on how to adjust some things and fix things so it would be easier for them. One of the comments we had was to add a windsock to one of our silos so that you could actually see the wind direction. Should we have a large chlorine release, it would matter whether you were upwind or downwind. I would say a dialogue between any industry and any uh, hazmat responder, very important. Communication is ultimately the most important thing because then they already know me, right, or they've met me, so they'd be more comfortable. And since they do know who I am, they also know who to approach should this ever happen. What keeps me up at night is, I guess, the worst case scenario where we would have a full release of a full chlorine ton and the amount of that chlorine could have possibly escape from our facility and uh, harm people. An accident here at our site would, would villainize the treatment plan. I think they would see us as uh, something harmful instead of something beneficial, which I believe is what we do when we take, you know, surface water and convert it to drinking water. It's important to understand measures that can be taken to properly secure your facility.
Water and wastewater treatment operations are potentially vulnerable to a wide range of security threats that could result in service disruptions or the release of chlorine gas. The consequences of a security incident could be severe, potentially impacting the safety of treatment plant workers and the surrounding community, and potentially disrupting service to critical sectors, including emergency services, healthcare, food processing, and manufacturing. A secure and resilient water and wastewater treatment operation requires effective planning and preparedness to prevent, mitigate, respond to, and recover from an incident. A malicious act resulting in the release of chlorine gas at a water or wastewater treatment plant can present risks to workers and the surrounding community. Consequently, it is important for those facilities to conduct security risk assessments and implement appropriate risk management measures. The overarching program for assessing risks and implementing protection strategies for drinking water and wastewater treatment operations is defined by the Water Sector Specific Plan, which was developed by the Water Sector Coordinating Council and Government Coordinating Council in close coordination with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. In addition, EPA has developed a variety of guidance documents and other informative resources to support water and wastewater treatment operations preparedness, response, and recovery. In order to prevent and mitigate the potential impact of malicious acts, facilities that use chlorine should consider the following types of security measures. Perimeter fencing and barriers. Intrusion detection systems and closed-circuit television CCTV cameras. Security lighting. Line-of-sight barriers security guards, personnel screening and background checks, limiting access to chlorine handling areas to authorized personnel only, vehicle and container inspection, process controls, automatic shutoff devices and fail-safe systems, inventory control systems and secure on-site storage, employee awareness and training, cybersecurity measures, emergency response plan exercises and drills, Collaboration with local law enforcement and first responders. Reporting of significant security incidents and suspicious activities. While it's crucial to have physical security measures in place to protect your facility, it's also necessary to protect information and computer networks that hold sensitive proprietary information, such as diagrams and specs, site maps, recipes and formulations, and procedures. Documents should be marked and secured properly and shredded when no longer needed. Employees should be aware of the potential risk of speaking about such content in conversation. There are also many possibilities to control and monitor computer transactions. The facility should also recognize the potential for outsiders to hack into control systems and adversely impact operations. Mitigation of this risk requires that operators understand how to isolate and disconnect control systems from networks and know how to operate the facility in manual mode. The security measures discussed in this video are only suggestions to consider because it's nearly impossible to encompass all of the possibilities to undertake. Every facility has its own unique characteristics and should have a unique security plan to match. Work with your management team to develop the security plans that are most appropriate for your facility. The use of chlorine in drinking water and wastewater treatment is essential to providing a safe, potable water supply and protecting the environment. In this program, we've covered a variety of information designed to help you better understand the hazards of chlorine use and how to make your facility safe and secure. We've discussed the various physical and chemical properties of chlorine, adverse health effects that could result from chlorine exposure, personal protective equipment to be used around chlorine, the transportation, storage, and handling of chlorine, how to connect, use, and disconnect chlorine containers, how to handle minor leaks, how to respond to emergencies, the importance of employee training and awareness, as well as site security measures. By following these policies and procedures, you can make your facility a safer workplace for all of your employees and be a better neighbor to your local community for years to come. My definition of success is when every day we can deliver safe water, proper dosages, 
of our chemicals and have everything run very smoothly and have nobody even think about us being here.